Hello and welcome to the Conservationist Assemble podcast, the podcast that seeks to unite the world's mightiest animal advocates to share their knowledge on the planet's amazing wildlife, the habitats they call home, and what we can do to ensure their future. Each episode we'll be discussing a particular species with an expert where you can expect to learn all about them and the work that is currently happening to keep them around for the future. So whether you're new to animal advocacy or a veteran in animal conservation, this is the podcast for you. Today's episode is all about the Francoise Langer, and our special guest joining the ranks of the Conservationist Assembly community is Belfast Zoo's very own Andrew Hope. Andrew is the ER's EEP coordinator for the Francoise Langer, and he is here to impart his wisdom on this fantastic species. Hey Andrew, thank you for joining us today on the podcast. How's it going? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. All good. Right, I'm glad to hear you're doing well. I'm, I'm thrilled to be discussing the Francois Langer with you. Uh, we certainly both agree that they're they're quite an overlooked, not just primate, but but species in general. Um, and I can't wait to hear your thoughts. So can you please tell us all about the Francois Langer? OK, well, I mean, there's an awful lot to tell you about them, but uh, I will try and be reasonably brief. So uh, our Francois Langers are a medium sized uh, primate uh, that belong to the Colobine family uh, that come from southeastern China and northern Vietnam. Uh, they're black in colour, they've got these lovely beautiful uh, white sideburns on them. Um, they're uh, a beautiful animal, roughly around about sort of six to eight kilos average in weight, so a medium sized monkey that live in some of the limestone karst regions of uh, that particular area of the world. Um, they're pretty adapted to living in those conditions. Um, they live primarily on leaves. Um, and yeah, they're just fantastic animal. They live in a, a, a sort of, I wouldn't say a unique, but a typical harem style um, society. And uh, they live in small groups numbering on average, sort of maybe sort of five to 11 animals. Perfect. So when you say that they're they're um, from quite a unique region or, or habitat, what what is that? OK, so um, they inhabit pretty much limestone karst regions, which are um, steep limestone cliffs uh, in the regions of southern China, and northern Vietnam. And, you know, they're, they're quite inaccessible areas, so very, very steep cliffs. Um, lots of valleys uh, and live in areas which are particularly hard for humans to get to. Um, so they're um, not very well known and they're not very often encountered by humans. It is really mean because when you think about primates, you automatically just think about them being in, in kind of wooded or forested areas. That's really interesting to hear about. Yeah, let's say like, I mean, you know, they, they do live in sort of forested areas, but I mean, the, these forested areas are not what you would call rainforest type forests. They're small um, sort of bushy forests that live sort of in around the limestone cliff areas. So you've got sort of lots of shrub sized trees, uh, not necessarily very big trees, but lots of shrubs and that sort of size of bush living on the limestone cliffs uh, and surrounding areas of these limestone cliffs. So with those those cliffs being relatively in, in accessible by humans and, and knowing that they are an endangered species, how or where are the threats to the Francois Langer coming from? OK, so um, realistically, the major threats are still hunting, poaching, um, obviously a wee bit of climate change uh, and pretty much as with most species on our planet today uh, it's you know most of them are threatened primarily by humans uh, so humans moving in for agriculture um, you know hunting uh, and you know basically depleting the forest and depleting the resources where these animals live now i know i said it's uh, inaccessible but uh, we as humans are very adept at getting to places that not many other animals can get to um, but yeah, so we're still able to plunder those resources which in which the Francois Langers live. Very true. Yeah, um, we uh, do find a way to get to these places should we we want to. So on the other side of the coin, then there are obviously reputable organisations and, and people who are, are trying to help the Francois Langer and, and, and all of these species. So what kind of 
actions are taking place in in terms of species survival? Right. So um, as far as I know now that uh, in China, we used to support uh, Fauna and Flora International who were working with um, Chinese authorities in China to try and conserve the Francois Langer. Uh, so firstly, uh, obviously, they would be interacting with the local governments, local forestry commissions to actually get um, the Francois Langer established as an endangered species and then as a protected species so to give them some level of protection. The same in Vietnam. Um, so the same situation happening there. Unfortunately, uh, the Chinese authorities uh, are no longer working with NGOs outside of uh, China. So unfortunately, uh, Fauna and Flora International are no longer working in China. So um, they are still working a little bit in Vietnam, as far as I'm aware. And we also have another organization uh, to which we are actually engaged with at the minute to establish a, a cooperative um, to support Francois Langer conservation. And they are the PRCF, which is the People's Resources uh, Conservation Foundation, uh, and they were established only in 2004, so a relatively new conservation organisation. And the really nice thing about PRCF is that they're a community based conservation organisation. Um, so they are working particularly with communities and the whole uh, ethos around it is if you support communities, communities will support um, you and what you're trying to achieve through conservation. That sounds like a great effort and, and look forward to to seeing how the work of PRCF and, and your support towards them grows. And it, it's all about that one plan approach, isn't it? There is obviously in situ and ex situ conservation and both have their merits, but ultimately it is how they mesh together. Um, so what are some of the other things that uh, ex situ conservation organisations are doing to help Francois Langer? OK, so I mean, in terms of uh, ex situ, obviously we've got our um, IASA EP, which is the ex situ breeding program. Um, so I've been doing that since 2005 uh, when we sort of put a proposal forward to establish Francois Langers as what was then an endangered species breeding program. Um, so last year uh, I teamed up with the um, IASA um, Afro-Eurasian monkey tag uh, to establish a long-term management plan for Francois. As part of that long-term management plan, we did, uh, we had to identify goals for the ex situ program. And the primary goals for that ex situ program are firstly as an insurance population, so thereby maintaining a genetically robust captive population should there be a need for reintroductions in the future, and also um, as an ambassador species to promote um, their cousins in the wild uh, and also to um, raise awareness and educate people about Francois Langers. Amazing. So let's go back to when you were first proposing setting up the EP and, and all of the communication you were having. What did you find? Did you find it was difficult to overcome species bias? Because like we said previously, they're not you know, when you think of a primate, they're certainly not that aware or people aren't that aware of them. So how did you find that, that species bias came into play? Um, well, it didn't really, in all honesty, uh, simply because there were a number of animals uh, at that time. I believe there was only five zoos in Europe that actually held Francois Langers and there was only somewhere in the region, maybe 24 animals. Uh, and initially, Rotterdam Zoo was the first zoo to um, bring these animals uh, into Europe in the modern era. Um, previously, Francois Langers had been held by Duisburg Zoo back in the late 60s. It was, I think, the earliest records of Francois Langers in European zoos, but there was only a couple of them. So with Rotterdam Zoo um, having brought in the first animals, um, we then brought in some animals ourselves. And again, at that time, our uh, assistant zoo manager uh, had a love for primates. He had obviously seen these primates in China previously uh, through visiting zoos over there, uh, and he liked them. So we brought some to the zoo and it was only after we started to breed a little bit and the more I sort of delved into Francois Langers and realised that, yes, these animals are particularly threatened and that their population was declining, that I thought, you know, maybe we should do something about this. Let's establish 
development programme. Let's get more zoos involved uh, and let's develop this as a conservation programme. So really that was the, the basis from which I put my business case forward to establish the breeding programme for Francois Langers. Fantastic. And, and what then kind of what actions need to happen to help improve the chances for the survival of Francois Langer, whether that be in zoos or, or out in China and Vietnam? Well, there's actually quite a lot, um, <laughs> which is quite disappointing to hear uh, and know. Um, but yeah, so I mean, working with uh, in situ conservation organisations is key. Um, part of that is actually educating the local inhabitants and supporting them. And that is the human inhabitants within the region where these animals live. So by supporting them uh, and allowing them to establish their own means of uh, developing an income, uh, promoting things like ecotourism um, uh, and teaching them how to be more, sust more sustainable will actually benefit the Francois Langers in the long term. Um, also in the longer term by allowing those um, in situ populations to thrive as they are, we can then use our captive populations to help support the wild populations. Because the biggest issue that we have in some of the areas, particularly in Vietnam, is that the small populations of Francois Langers, which are there, are becoming isolated from one another and they're being isolated through things like um, natural barriers such as dams and reservoirs uh, and also roads and infrastructure. Um, so they're becoming genetically isolated. So you're getting these bottlenecks of genetic degra degradation. Sorry, can't get can't quite get that out. But um, so you've got literally small populations which are becoming inbred and then not able to mix. So one of the things that will hopefully be looking towards in the future will be things like translocations or supplementation of the wild populations from captive stock. Now we know our captive stock is quite genetically diverse. We actually conducted a study uh, a couple of years ago um, in zoos uh, based on the captive population that we had and we identified genetic markers from wild specimens that were already um, in universities and uh, labs and so on. So we had information there and we were able to compare that with the captive population. It looks like the captive population is quite genetically diverse from quite a large distribution area. So we've got a good source of uh, genetic material to put back into the wild. That is fantastic and certainly very encouraging um, as and when you know we get to a point where, where we are able to do that. So for members of the public or, or people who aren't involved directly with in situ or ex situ conservation, what actions can they take to get involved with Francois Langers? Yeah, so um, as with all good modern zoos, our primary aim is to highlight the profile of endangered species in the wild and what zoos do. So first thing they can do is obviously visit their zoos and support their local zoos. Most zoos these days are uh, obliged to contribute to conservation in some way, shape or form. So by visiting your zoo, your zoo, you're generating income which can then support in situ conservation. Um, supporting your zoos as well actually keeps the zoos running as a business, which allows them to devote resources to building new enclosures, new exhibits that will allow us to grow our captive population and make more space for the captive population. Again, captive populations, if they're small, are not sustainable, so you have to have a certain number of animals, so you require a certain number of zoos to participate with your breeding programme. So by supporting your local zoos in the first instance is great. Uh, second of all, I suppose, supporting the communities that need the help uh, where the Francois Langers come from. And again, that's about education and resources um, and actually, you know, being able to support them any way, shape or form that you can, whether that's financially or just through education, outreach or any of those messages. And we mentioned obviously that, that over time you've you've gained a fondness for the Francois Langer. So what exactly do they mean to you personally? I just think, you know, from my point of view, I, I mean, 
I always wanted to sort of work with animals. I always wanted to do something for conservation. Uh, and, you know, primates are not necessarily have always been my thing. You know, reptiles actually used to be my thing, uh, if I'm totally honest. But I quite like these monkeys. They were different. Um, and because they were not very well known, I thought, you know, this is something that I could get interested in. And this is something that because there's nothing going on with them, there's no conservation uh, and very little is known about them. It's something that I could sort of get my teeth into and actually do something about. So there was a little goal for me. Um, uh, and since I've started doing that, you know, they've grown on me, um, having worked with them personally for a number of years, having hand reared animals, you know, have grown to like them and love them, you know, uh, as I do. So that's why they're close to my heart at the moment. Um, yeah, we should mention for our listeners that you've recently had breeding success with the Francois Langer. You know, just not a lot of people realise, but, you know, um, harem species generally give birth more or less all at the same time or within the space of a, a few days or weeks of each other. And that's simply because you find that harem species, particularly that of primates, uh, they actually, actually synchronise their Easter cycles so that they all breed at the same time. Um, so, yeah, you know, we've had that happening at the zoo for a number of years now with our beautiful group of Francois Langers. And um, we had two births 18 months ago. So I know they're in the birth period and captivity is around about 18 months or so. So I knew that around about Christmas time of last year, uh, we were going to be expecting a couple of babies and certainly the females were looking heavily unrounded. Uh, and of course, the first one came along just before Christmas and the other one just after Christmas. Well, it's no rest for <laughs> for the wicked. Eh? Um, so what was your first experience with Francois Langers? Because like we say, they're not that well represented. So there's certainly not many keepers that can relate. No, again, I mean, it, it was sort of, you know, going back probably 25 years or so now. And it was around about 1998 when the first Francois Langers came into captivity in Europe. Uh, and I think we received ours first ones in around about 2000, 2002, somewhere around there. So um, when we brought these animals into the zoo, I'd never seen them before. Uh, didn't actually know anything about them other than when I first heard they were coming to the zoo through our assistant manager at the time. Uh, I looked them up and I thought, oh, you're a different looking monkey. I haven't seen you before. Um, it'd be nice to work with you. And of course, we had them because our first animals came from China. Uh, they had to undergo rabies quarantine. So they spent six sure. months in rabies quarantine. That's where I first worked with them. Um, so, yeah, they were, um, I wouldn't say necessarily an overly friendly monkey. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they, they can be quite boisterous. Um, but yeah, you know, they were different. Uh, say interesting nice pretty to look at yeah they are they've got very unique characteristics with like you say the sideburns and, and the, uh, the 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 quiff on top and um, so yeah they are enjoyable to look at and so Andrew thank you for for giving us an insight into the Francois Langers and, and kind of a brief history of of their time in in ex situ conservation and um, now we want to focus more on on you and your career and, and how you got to where you are so can you just give us a little bit of a background into how you got to where you are today please yeah so um well <laughs> as a child i actually grew up in south africa so uh, i was always close to nature uh, growing up as a kid in south africa you know a lot of people think that you know you live in africa you live out in the bush that was quite the opposite we lived in the city uh, but we lived on the periphery of the city and of course the bush wasn't too far away so we like getting out in the bush and some friends of mine at the time um, introduced me to keeping reptiles uh, so i think it was about probably about eight or nine years old when i sort of came across my first uh, wild snake in south africa a harmless snake called a brown house snake so um started keeping them with some friends uh, and my interest developed uh, in reptiles from that. Um, I then came to Northern Ireland when I was 16 years of age. Uh, and because I'd been sort of looking after snakes at home, and that was my primary, primary area of interest and focus for what was, you know, six or seven years, um, I thought, you know, the only place I'm going to get to work snakes and lizards would be at the zoo. So 
Um, when I was still attending school, my week of work experience, I uh, decided to come to the zoo. And during that period, I got the opportunity to work with chimps, lions, uh, gemsbok, um, sun bears, pumas, uh, green vervet monkeys, uh, mona monkeys, diana monkeys, and a few others. Um, so I really, really enjoyed it and enjoyed the, the physical aspect to it. And I thought, you know, this is something that I, I'd really like to do. And I also sort of knew that there was the opportunity to um, continue with my studies whilst actually working in the zoo. So that sort of sold it for me. And that's pretty much how I started in the zoo and been working uh, at Belfast Zoo since I was 18. Amazing. And has there been one individual animal or species in your career so far that you would say has defined it either from your initial love of reptiles through to now what you're doing with primates? It's a very difficult question because there's so many animals I love working with. Um, Francois Langer is obviously one of them. Uh, but I think, you know, going back and thinking back in my early career, I looked after uh, lions and I looked after tigers. I enjoyed looking after those. Um, cats weren't necessarily my thing, but then uh, at that particular time, not long after I started the zoo, was sort of going through a period of um, expansion, looking at new enclosures, looking at new species and so on. Uh, and we brought Eastern Bongo to the zoo um, and they're a beautiful antelope and actually surprisingly calm and I wouldn't say tame, but, you know, not nervous like most antelope. Uh, and some of them were sort of hand tame. Uh, and Malayan tapirs was another species that I got to work with. Again, you know, fairly docile animal, really, really nice animal to work with. Um, um, haven't seen the first, you know, births of those animals at Belfast Zoo. Uh, and at that time, those animals weren't being bred in captivity particularly well, and we'd done so well with them. That really sort of set it off for me, and I really enjoyed working with those particular animals. So, is there one lesson that being EEP coordinator has taught you? Um, <sighs> I wouldn't say there's just one lesson. There's probably been many lessons, in all honesty. Um, I think, you know, from a coordinator's point of view, it, A, it's not an easy task because you're trying to satisfy a lot of people who have got lots of wants. And they not only have the interest of the animal at heart, but they have also the interest of their own zoological institution uh, and what those animals can bring to it. Um, in terms of what it has taught me as well is about, you know, working together, working with partners, working with other zoos is key to managing any breeding program. You have to be able to work with other people. Um, and there also has to be understanding as well that, you know, you won't always be able to keep everybody happy. And some people are not going to be happy through the decisions that you have to make. But you have to sort of take comfort from the fact that you're making those decisions for the best reasons. Absolutely. And, and yeah, hopefully, um, I'm sure a lot of people will resonate with that and, and agree wholeheartedly with what, what you're saying. So knowing what you know now, or yeah, what advice would you give to, to someone looking to get involved with conservation? Um, the advice I would give would be, you know, first of all, be open minded. Conservation it's not necessarily working directly with animals. It could be working with people, which I think is key to all conservation measures. You have to be open to the fact that you might not be hands on with animals. A lot of people sort of associate conservation work with working directly with animals and protecting animals. But there's lots of different ways of doing that. So I think being open minded about that side of thing is key. Um, I think Another thing to sort of learn from it is that there'll be many disappointments along the way. It's not always positive. Sometimes it's very disappointing, uh, particularly when you get feedback from, you know, guys who are working out in the field where you think things are going particularly well and you think that you're making a difference and then suddenly it all comes crashing down because of natural disaster or war and conflict or um, government bureaucracy or anything along those lines. So it's not always smooth sailing, but you know, if you can if you can ride out the rough 
uh, and get to the smooth, it can be very rewarding. Right, incredibly wise, and I think yeah, it's it's important to acknowledge all aspects of of this industry. And um, so th yeah, thank you for for telling us that. And um, what do you think is commonly misunderstood about modern zoos? Yeah, I think you know does, what I sort of said at the beginning, like when you asked me about how people can support in situ conservation. I don't think a lot of people still understand what zoos or modern zoos are all about. And again, partially that's probably our own fault. Um, but again, in this new world and this new area of uh, social media and all the rest of it, we do have new avenues to get our messages out there. You know, zoos are working primarily now towards conservation. And I think if people um, and particularly sort of icons within the industry um, and those sort of big figureheads that people look up to can support zoos. That will perhaps maybe change people's ideas of what zoos are about. A lot of people think zoos are cruel. Um, and yeah, zoo, zoos have come an awful long way from when I started in the zoo world, but we still a long, long way to go. And I think accepting that the zoos have got a long way to go, go, and if people accept that the zoos are constantly trying to improve and make themselves better and contribute towards conservation, there might be a better understanding from public of zoos. So again, I think it's up to us to make sure that we get our message out there. We promote whatever it is we're trying to do. But at the same time, the difficulty I think that zoos have is that they have to strike a balance uh, in terms of Yes, you're running a business, you have to get visitors in. Without those visitors, you can't su sustain your zoo. If you can't sustain your zoo, you can't sustain your conservation ethos. So I think if if public were to understand that a little bit better and they understood what it was we were trying to achieve a bit better, I think maybe we'd get a wee bit more support. And so then what um, gives you motivation to keep going? Again, I think really it's just, you know, working with animals, working in this industry, you know, every, I've always said to any visitor that comes and asks me, every day is a school day. You never stop learning. Um, and that's the most enjoyable part about it is that, you know, there's always something new to learn. There's always something that you didn't know that you discover. Um, and when you do manage to you know, make a difference, it's very, very rewarding. Uh, and just to know that you're making that little bit of difference, you know, gives you an awful lot of comfort and it also inspires me to continue doing what I'm doing. I get a great lot of satisfaction out of, you know, telling my story, you know, helping people that don't quite understand what zoos are about or what they what it is we're doing if I can get them to understand what we're doing and change their minds and their attitudes I feel I've achieved something um as you rightly say you know we still need to change an awful lot of attitudes along, uh, amongst a large proportion of our communities but if we can do that then we've achieved something so there's always a goal to be achieved and achieving those goals along with the conservation message and achieving conservation goals is part of what drives me. Yeah, I can I can tell that just by listening to you and, and obviously our listeners can't see you, but just by yeah watching you talk, I can see that you get a real kick out of, of doing what you're doing and, and you can feel the, the 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 motivation there. And so Andrew, thank you for telling us a little bit about what makes you tick. Uh, we are just going to have some quick fire questions to finish on a bit of a light note um, before I, I let you get back to, to your day. So are there one to five dream species that you'd love to see in the wild? Yes, uh, I've never seen gorillas in the wild, so gorillas is something I would like to go and see in the wild. Um, obviously, my Francois Langers, I've never been and seen them in the wild. Yes, so that's a key species I'd love to see in the wild. I think, you know, I'd love to go and see um, probably polar bears in the wild would be another species. Penguins is another, quite like penguins. Um, it's hard to think of 
you know, one individual species that I would like to see beyond that. Tree kangaroos would probably be another. I'd love to see tree kangaroos in the wild too. Yeah, great shout out to tree kangaroos there. But yeah, all of those would be fantastic species. And 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 then I suppose was is there one country or, or continent that you'd love to spend an extended amount of time in? Again, I, I grew up in Africa, and Africa I always deemed as my home. So it's it's a continent I'd probably love to go back to at some stage and call it my home if I could afford it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's the issue, isn't it? There. And um, if you could be an animal, what would it be, and why? Difficult question. There's so many animals that yes, I would love to be. Um, primate would be one, just simply because many primates are so agile uh, mm. and so strong, uh, and they can get just about anywhere. So to sort of almost have that superhuman power to, you know, climb and ascend into trees and mountains and so on effortlessly. Um, any of the bird species again having that ability to fly and wander wherever you wanted to across this great planet would be another. Um, uh, and then again, maybe a tortoise, because you'd live an awful long time, see the world go by and do very little. <laughs> Fantastic answers. Um, so when you're not working, Andrew, how do you keep busy? Well, <laughs> there's so many things that would keep me busy. Um, uh, golf is one of them. I love playing golf. Um, so I love getting out on the golf course. Don't get enough time for it and we don't get the best of weather for it. So spending more time playing golf would be uh, greatly appreciated, I think. <laughs> yeah, very, very nice. And, and last one then, what do you think is the one thing that our listeners should take away from today's episode? Um, I think one thing that they should really take away is that there are people like me that, you know, drive forward conservation, um, but they can make a difference is the key message I'd like to get to everybody. Now, should it be the little things like making sure that you're um, buying the right stuff out of the supermarket that doesn't contain things like palm oil, something that doesn't impact negatively on our planet? Um, think cautiously about, you know, buying red meat and contributing towards global warming. You know, those kinds of things like you know, there's lots of little things that can make a huge difference. Things like, you know, plugging in your mobile phone, do you need to leave it on charge all night? No, you don't. Unplug things which you're not plugged in, save energy, you know, stop global warming. You know, global warming is affecting climate change, which is affecting animals across the world. You only have to look at things like polar bears um, not having the ice sheets to, to migrate on and things like that. You know, the flash floods across the world. You know, everybody can make a small difference. Uh, and it's those small differences, if we add them all together, that can make a big difference. I think that's the key message. Yeah, perfect note to finish up on then. So, Andrew, a massive shout out for you, to you for, for gracing the podcast of your your presence and, and, and knowledge today. Um, and yeah, keeping us enlightened on how we can all contribute towards the, the future of Francois Langers and, and all the species on the planet. So we wish you all the best in your career and, and maybe a trip to the golf course sometime soon um, if the weather permits and yeah we'll be sure to keep up to date with all of the work of, of Belfast Zoo and, and the projects you're supporting. All right. Thank you very much appreciate it. That's all from the Conservationist Assembly podcast this week thanks a million for tuning in. Be sure to follow the podcast on Instagram at Conservationist Assemble Pod to stay connected to the latest updates. And hey, if you found this episode as amazing as I did, be sure to like, share and review. This helps us spread the word and bring you more conservation heroes with their fascinating stories. Thank you so much and catch you all next time.